Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, California Resources Corporation, Southern California Edison, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Chuck. Give us a call if you need help with your math, math homework, studying for a test, doing makeup work. You can call us here in Bakersfield at 636-4357. Toll free in the outlying areas such as San Luis Obispo County, you can call 1-866-636-6284. You can email us questions at do the math at kern.org. You can watch the show live online at do the math at kern.org and you can look at it, look for us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, and as a reminder, if you call from San Luis Obispo County and we do your math problem, you'll automatically get yourself some ice cream courtesy of our friends at Doc Bernstein's Ice Cream Lab. Mm, that that's good. is a tasty little deal right there. Well, we'll be going out to Chevron in a little bit. We'll be visiting with uh, Devin out there and some of the folks and finding out what they do behind the scenes at Chevron. Mm -hmm. We also have a special guest in studio. We have some phone calls to get to, but first, let's take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, I know it's early to start talking about summer vacation, but do you have any plans <laughs> for summer vacation coming up? in 2017. Wow, no, we don't yet. Not yet, that, not not, yet. I, I myself don't have any plans yet either. <laughs> I know we'll go to a couple of ballparks, not sure which ones yet, mm -hmm. but we'll see who has games when and what's close by. August 21st, okay. 2017 may turn out to be the most popular vacation day request in history. Really? Says a writer in Discover Magazine, why? Why? Because on that date, for this first time in 99 years, wow, really, a total eclipse of the sun will be visible across the United States, from sea to shining sea. sea. Millions of Americans will be in easy driving distance of a spectacle that has been called indescribable, unforgettable, even life-altering. Yeah. Now, if it was indescribable, unforgettable, and life-altering, wouldn't you make sure you were taking part in this? Absolutely. First time in 99 years? Once in a lifetime. There you go. The sun will disappear for about two and a half minutes beginning in Oregon at about 10.15 a.m. local time, move eastward, ending about a half an hour later in South Carolina. Now, we have a map here of the path in which you'll be able to view this mm -hmm. at its best. A senior editor at Astronomy Magazine Takes, the, takes very seriously the idea that if you don't plan ahead, you could miss out on this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If you look around the internet, you'll see that hotels and campgrounds along the 50 to 70 mile wide path of totality have been booking up already. Hmm. So a year in advance, people have been booking hotels and vacation spots along this path already. And he says, close is not close enough. Just as the person who only smells the meal outside the steakhouse remains hungry, <laughs> so too do those who observe the eclipse from outside the path of totality end the day wondering what all the fuss was about. Or from another blogger, likening a partial eclipse to a total eclipse is like comparing almost dying to dying. It's like, it's, it's not, the, it's not like the same. You get close, but it's not the same as the other one. So if you're not within this span, you know, mm -hmm. 50 to 70 miles along that line, I guess you're going to be like, well, yeah, I saw some of it, but what's the big deal? Yeah, and uh, I, I, 
I'm looking at these cities. I, I can think. My uh, my brother lives up by Salem, Oregon, so we might, oh, go, you might make a trip. Might so you're up there at the uh, there, end yeah. of August, and it says the greatest eclipse point is near Nashville. So if you're in Tennessee and kind of close over there, yeah. and the end of August, a lovely time I'm sure it would be at the end of August <laughs> on the I'm East sure. Coast, Central of the United States. But anyway, it's like, all right, what are we going to do with this? So I figured, all right, that was a pretty cool story. Yeah. So distance traveled. So distance problems are things that students start working on, uh, usually sixth, seventh grade, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. So here's an example. A hummingbird flies at a rate of 28 miles per hour for half an hour, because usually they're in whole hours. So I figure let's yes. do a half an hour. How far does the hummingbird fly? Well, in words, to find the distance traveled, multiply the speed by the time. Distance equals speed times time. So, in algebra, distance equals speed, rate times time. And then in arithmetic, we do it, distance is equal to 28 miles times the one hour times a half hour, because we're doing a half hour instead of the one. So we can see that the hummingbird flies 14 miles in that half hour using the distance equals rate times time formula right there. Mm -hmm. And that is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available on Tuesdays and Wednesdays between 3.30 and 5.30. And so up in Salem. Up in Salem. You're thinking that's where you're going to be. My brother lives just south of Eugene, Oregon, which is pretty close to Salem. All right. Well, right you there know along what? Interstate 5. It will be a once-in-a-lifetime event. Yeah. I'll and you won't want that two and a half minutes to skip you by. Next time I talk to him, I'll... Uh, alert I'll, him. I'll, I'll alert him. <laughs> Don't I'll forget make my reservation with August him. August 21st. That's the day <laughs> right it. there. Hey, we're going to visit Chevron in a little while, bring on our guests. But first, let's go to our first phone call. Colby, how are you today? Good, how are you? Good. You're a sixth grade student, correct? Yes. All right. As soon as you're ready, let's hear the math problem that you're working on. Okay, so I have nine N plus 8 equals 44. Okay, now today we have a pretty simple equation, right? We don't have yes. to do any simplifying, no parentheses. So yes. you just have to go through the two steps that you need to solve for n, right? So when we're all done, down here we want n equals, and that's going to be our answer, right? Yes. So to get n all by itself, we have to get rid of two numbers. We have to get rid of the 9 and the 8, which one do you get rid of first? You get rid of the 8 first. All right, and how do you do that? So you, um, under it, you subtract 8 from the positive 8. Right, because the opposite of addition is subtraction. We're trying to cancel that out. And what else? Yeah. And then you subtract uh, 44 minus 8. Okay, so you did it to both sides of the equation, right? Yes. And we have to keep that equation balanced. That's why whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other to keep it balanced, right? Yes. Okay, I'll do the easy part. 8 minus 8 is 0, isn't it? So on this yes. side, we get 9n. That's all that's left. And what yes. do we have over here? 44 minus 8. Is 36. 36. Okay, so we got rid of the 8. How do we get rid of the 9? So um, you divide 9n equals 36 divided by 9. Okay, why dividing? So, uh, so, it, um, so you get the n, so it, um, it's a, like a, a, the answer, I guess. Right, right. so you're, you're dividing because just like here, we were adding and you subtracted to get rid of it, right? Yes. 9n means 9 times n, doesn't it? Yes. And so to undo that multiplication, we're going to divide, and we show division by that fraction bar, right? Yes. And we have to do the same thing to both sides. So now we're canceling out the multiplication by dividing. Again, I'll do the easy part. 9 divided by 9 is 1, right? So I could yes. write 1 in, couldn't I? But yes. What's 1 times n? Is uh, just n. Just n, right? So I don't even need the 1, right? And yeah. n equals 36 divided by 9, which yes. is? What's so 36 divided by 9 is 4. 4. Okay, so your answer down here should be 4. But yes. we're not done, right? No. What, do, what else do you have to do before you finish with this problem? Um, what do you have you to do? You have to, like, rewrite it. Yeah, we've got to take that 4, right, and check our answer back up here, right? Yep. So do you check it down here? 
Say what? Where do you check your answer? Down here or back up here at the original problem? At the original problem. Okay, so I'm going to put 4 in here for n, right? So I'm going to write 9 times 4 plus 8. So the question is, does that equal 44? What's 9 times 4? 36. Which we had here. Plus 8? Equals 44. And it does check, doesn't it? Yes. And so we take that extra, what, few seconds, 15, 20 seconds to put the problem, put the answer back up in the original problem and make sure that it works. All right? Thanks for, the yeah. uh, thanks for the phone call. All right. Nicely done right there, Colby. And you've also got your name entered into the drawing for the Condors four-pack. So we'll see what happens at the end of the program today. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530. If you're calling from San Luis Obispo, don't forget, toll free at 1-866-636-6284. Call in, automatically get yourself some duor, er, duor. Mm -hmm. We like all ice cream. But yes. if you call from San Luis Obispo, Obispo right. you'll be getting Doc Bernstein's okay. ice cream. And that is tasty over there. In studio with us right now, we have Thomas. How are you this afternoon? Pretty good. Why don't you let everybody know where you go to school and what grade you're in? I go to Stockdale, and I'm in fourth grade. How's fourth grade going? Going pretty well. Got straight A's last quarter, so... Yeah, there I'm you good. go. Pretty sweet, dude. Yeah. You guys must have report cards coming out then, so mm -hmm. you already know what your grades are and stuff. You're going along pretty smoothly, huh? Well, I haven't got my grades yet. I think I'm getting into them next week or this week. Okay. But you know you're doing well. You've got A's and everything. Yeah. Fourth grade's going pretty well. Uh -huh. How do you like the longer day? Because you have to stay in school longer now, don't you? Yeah, only 30 minutes. Only 30 minutes? But it's fun because um, most likely we get 30, 45 minutes of PE, so if you subtract okay. that by the So it's 30. like you're going to school shorter even then. Yeah. Because you get more <laughs> PE time. Yeah. All right, there you go. Well, we're going to have you do some work in just a little bit, but right now we're going to go live. We've got Chevron and we've got Devin out there. Let's find out what's going on. everybody back in the studio. Mike, Chuck, how's it going Thomas? I hope you're having a great time back there. Today we're here at Chevron and I want to introduce you to Quinn Woodard. Uh, Quinn is a, a business unit electrical engineer here with Chevron. Uh, Quinn, tell us a little bit about what that means. Uh, so as a business unit electrical engineer, I support the facility engineering group. Ultimately, I report up in the ASBT structure, which is automation SCADA of power team. And my background is electrical engineering. I focus on the power. So I, I work with uh, operations, maintenance, uh, reliability groups to uh, to build engineering and electrical solutions. So, I mean, a lot of science, a lot of math involved with this position here in, uh, in Bakersfield with Chevron. And, you know, Chevron's got a pretty big footprint here in the town as well. So, you know, a lot of those skills that we talk about in the classroom have that, you know, higher end application that we see with a position like yours. So let's, let's take a look around here at Chevron and, and kind of get into a peek of, of what a day in the life of a business unit electrical engineer is like. Sure, I'll, I'll lead the way. So. Uh, this campus right here, this is our main campus here in Bakersfield. It's called 9525. Uh, we have several buildings here at this campus. And then we also have various field locations around the surrounding areas of Bakersfield. So as we transition in from the A building into the B building, this entire bottom floor is our ASPT group that I mentioned early, earlier. ASPT stands for Automation SCADA Power Team. Uh, within that, we have automation engineers, electrical power engineers, and we also have a capital projects group. Uh, the subgroup underneath that is our system completions group, which focuses mainly on construction and commissioning items. So a lot of groups, a lot of members of this team. You know, there's a big space too. There's a lot of, of room for a lot of engineering to take place. How many uh, employees with Chevron would uh, be working in this space here? Uh, the numbers have uh, obviously decreased over the years due to the current environment, but at any time we, could, we work with a, a very broad workforce with business partners, uh, contract work staff, as well as Chevron employees with all those disciplines that I previously mentioned. Now, this is a facility designed to support the work that you guys do uh, as engineers, work not just with the technology, but you know, with your understanding of, of the, the science and the math that goes on behind it. So, you know, what, what are some of the facilities around here that we could take a look at? Sure, I'll show there? you guys our demonstration and simulation lab. Okay. So, obviously, we engineer, we analyze, uh, we design, and we make sure that our solutions are 100% accurate for what the oil fields that we're going to install them in. So, this is one of our DSL labs. Uh, we have another one on this campus, and as I previously mentioned, uh, we want to make sure that everything's 100% right because these solutions are going into operations uh, in oil field environments, which can be 
risky, but we want to make sure it's 100% accurate because we focus on our people and environment. So the work that you do here really impacts a lot of the work that happens out in the fields around Bakersfield and through the Central Valley. So there, there's a lot of communication and, and, and uh, connection with the, the, the team members that you have. Correct. Correct. It's very important to, uh, to be able to communicate in all directions, right? So we have operations personnel, we have maintenance personnel, we have leadership. So you need to be able to speak a certain lingo to get your points across correctly so we can get the ultimate solution. So, you know, our viewers at home are thinking about the work that they're doing in the classroom and how that connects to a position like yours, Quinn. Is there an example of, of something like that you could show as far as the, the, the work that our students are, are, are planning to, to master here? Definitely. So uh, as an electrical engineer, I stated earlier that I, my main focus is power engineering. And one of the first things I learned in my undergraduate studies was the power triangle, which I, I'll draw for you all here. Um, and, and you'll be able to recognize this in some of your coursework if you're enrolled in some of your algebra courses. So here with the power triangle, um, it's gonna show a relationship between the AC three-phase power. So what I'm drawing here is S is our hypotenuse. That's our apparent power. And then your units there are typically VA. And then you have your reactive power which is V, A, R, volts, amps, reactive. And then you have your real power. This is the power that everyone knows about, your watts. And so I'll just draw a W there. So essentially, your reactive power is your regulation of, of your voltage source. So I mentioned this is your real power. And then the vector sum between these two gives you your apparent power. You know what that sounds a lot like? That sounds quite a bit like the Pythagorean theorem. Exactly, and, and that's exactly what it is. So if I know any two of these variables, I can solve for the others just utilizing the Pythagorean theorem. So what you're able to use is the Pythagorean theorem to make sense of how to distribute power to the wells around Kern County and the work that you do with Chevron to make sure that the energy is being produced and that nothing shorts out and you have enough power to support everybody. Correct. So at the end of the day, our goal is to make sure that the system operates reliably and nothing is overloaded and that everything is operating as designed. So that connection of what you know the math looks like in, in the classroom, here we're seeing a direct application of of, of how that supports the work that the team here at Chevron does in supporting the community here in Bakersfield. Uh, and a little bit later on in the show, we're going to talk a little bit about how skills like this and the understanding of why this works allows Quinn and his team to work with technology to support a lot of the, the skills and, and the needs of, of Chevron. So until then, Mike, back to you in the studio. All right, nicely done. So we'll visit with Devin and uh, get back to Chevron in just a little bit. Do remember, we have phone tutors available until 5.30 on most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. In studio, we do have Thomas with us, a fourth grade student, and we're going to make you start doing a little bit of work now. Okay. All right, instead of just standing here looking good between all three of us, you're going to get over there and start doing some work, all right? Over to the board, young man. It is my understanding that in fourth grade, you are starting to do a little bit more multiplication, correct? Right. And one of the problems that you were talking about is 81 times 81. So why don't you write that down on the board, kind of large. Okay. Yep, remember, keep the pen out there. There you go. 81 times 81. And if you would, explain to us how you do that problem. I use partial products by, by I times the tens, and then I times, well, I times the 80 times the one, and then I times the one times the 80. I'll just write it on the board. So I do 80 times 80 equals 6,004. Wait, wait. <laughs> what yeah, that? Interesting. Funny <laughs> things that board will do yeah, if you get your hand close to it. Yeah, so just go ahead and write it down here. Just forget okay. that, rewrite it down here. So I do 6,400 because 80 times 80 is 6,400. And then I do the 80 times the 1 equals 80. And I do, oh wait. And then I do 1 times the 80 equals 80. And then I do 1 times 1 equals 1, and that will equal. There you go. Oh, so I, that's 16, so I put 1 on the top, 6, 1, and then I put 6,561. That's the answer. And that's 81 times 81. Right, so it's done a little differently because a lot of students mm -hmm. and sometimes parents that are watching and older students will go, well, I remember we did 1 times 1. Right then one times eight, and then put the placeholder, move over, do the eight times one again. So why don't you erase that one, and I'll give you another problem to work on, and Chuck will erase okay, it for you. It's a little easier watch, then. Watch this. Oh, thank you. There we go. All right, Thomas, how about if you give me a two-digit number? Uh, 80, wait, no, 91 times 91. Well, you give me the first number. We're not gonna do the same number again. 
Oh. So we're going to mix up the two numbers this time. Uh, 85 times 85? Well, you go 85, so put 85, put 85 up 85. on the board. And now I'm going to give you the second number, but we're not going to make it 85. So let's go with 63, the first two numbers in our phone number. So how would you like to approach that problem to multiply it? Well, I would just do partial products like I did on the last one. So I do 60 times 80, 4,800. Oh, wait. Oh. I do 4,800, and then I do 60 times 5, and that's 300, and I do 3 times 80, and that's 240, and I do 5 times 3, it goes 15. And that would equal. We may have to have move, move, move that move board up. There, there you go. go. And add, and that will put one more. So that would be five. And that's 11. 11 plus two and goes three. Put five and another five. So it would equal. 5,355. Excellent. Nicely done right there. And I like that you have those math facts. Mm -hmm right at the tip of your tongue because you were going all right then I go three times 80 is 240 you didn't have to stop and think about that at all so that's important because I know students a lot of times in second grade will start learning their multiplication facts and that's why you need to memorize those have those like that so that you can do that multiplication as quick as Thomas is doing yeah. right now erase the board I've got one more problem for you mm -hmm. yeah, just have Chuck make it all disappear it's easier like that there we go all right uh, let's have Chuck come up with the number first Okay, how about uh, 47? And Thomas, you can come up with the second number, but it can't be 47. Okay, uh, 76. So, I just do 70 times 40, and that's 2,800. Because I just do this to my numbers. I know 4 times 7 is 28, and I know to add those two back zeros. So right, because you have 70 and 40, so you have those two zeros. So yeah. Put the two, right. And I put another zero, and I do 70 times 7 equals 490. Four hundred and ninety. What, what's happening? Yeah, try to hold the pin there. There you go. <laughs> so I do four hundred and ninety. What? Okay. Ninety. Mm -hmm. And then I do six times forty goes two hundred and forty. And then I do 6 times 7 equals 42. So it turns out you're doing the problem very much the same way other people would do it, you're, because they're still going to multiply those four things. You're just doing them in a little bit different order, because yeah. you like starting with the big number first and then working down. Yeah. So, so it works really well for you, and it, you keep it nice and organized. Yeah. 2, 4, 12, 14, so that's 1, so 3. Three, but then you have to put that one at top, so that's so that's nine plus six equals five, and then for thirteen, thirteen that's seven and two, so I would end up with three thousand five hundred and seventy-two. Nicely done, and it amazes me how he goes from left to right. That's right. In, instead of going from the ones to the thousands, you started here and moved over. You right. just have and to keep track of your bar of your carrying as you're doing that. Yeah. Keep track of. And he's got that process down, and it works this, beautifully for him. So Thomas, nicely good. done right there on the multiplication. Six three six four three five seven is the phone number. We'll get Thomas back to work, and we'll be out with Chevron in a little bit right after this. Here we are taking another look at the sweet side of science. We're at Nestle Ice Cream in Bakersfield. 
With me today, I've got Kelsey with us. We're going to go in and check it out. But first, we need to meet Jared, food technologist at Nestle. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for coming, guys. Hey, you know what? We're looking forward to this. Maybe we can sample a little something at the end. We ready to go take a look? Let's go do it. All right, let's go. Today we're in Bakersfield, we're at the Nestle plant, and today we've got Jared with us. And Jared, what is your title here at Nestle? Uh, I'm a food technologist for Nestle Dryers Ice Cream. So you're a food technologist. That's right. What exactly does that mean? Because some students are going, all right, you work at Nestle, what does a food technologist do? Sure. Well, uh, I guess you could say that we, we handle the science behind the food. So food scientist, that was uh, my degree. Um, so what we do here is we develop and industrialize, meaning we uh, scale up to big production levels uh, of all of our ice cream flavors. So you get to come up with different items and different things That's and right. see how they turn out. That's right. All right. Well, with us this afternoon also, we've got our student co-host, Kelsey. Uh, so what will we be doing today? So today, uh, we're going to get to see uh, some new mixes being made. We're in our test facility. We'll see it uh, go through the process from start to finish. And on the other side here, we'll get to see some uh, mix being frozen into pints. So finished ice cream. All right, so the first thing we have to do is get the mix, right? That's right. Let's head over and see the mix. Okay. So what are the ingredients that are used in most of your batches? The main component is dairy, so uh, different components of uh, the raw milk. In uh, the mix that we're making today, it's a dairy-based mix, so we'll use uh, cream and condensed milk, we'll add some sugar in, and then a few different stabilizers um, to make uh, full fat ice cream at the end. In what role do the stabilizers play? Uh, components of fat and water that don't like to be together, so that those uh, stabilizers kind of surround the different components, along with the emulsifiers to keep it stabilized. The stabilizers give it more body and texture. What is the next step in the process? So after the mix is actually batched, okay. um, we'll send it to a homogenizer and then through a HTST pasteurizer. All right, we ready to move to the next step? Let's do it. All right. So we're at the flavor vats, and what's inside of here? So this is where we pull the mix in. Um, as you see down here, there are some agitators, so these propellers down here. Once the mix is pulled in, those uh, spin so nothing settles out. So we need to keep it under agitation so it, it continually mixes and stays homogenous. Uh, so I can show you the mix that we just, we just saw get batched is in one of our tanks here, right here. Nice and smooth. So you see just a little bit of foaming and you get that little air incorporation when it's pumped over but it looks good here because uh, there's not a thick layer of foam on the top. So the foaming is just that air from going from one container to the next over? That's right. That's all that is? Yep. We'll uh, keep the mix here uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, could be, depending on the application, could be as short as two hours, up to six hours, or overnight even, to age the mix. Now a lot goes on during the aging process uh, to uh, set up the mix for freezing. Well, if we follow this one through all the way, we don't want to do the overnight one, so we'll go for the two-hour one. What do you think, Kels? Mm -hmm. All right. Sounds good. Now we get to the good part where we start adding flavors to it, correct? That's right, yep. Uh, what we do is uh, uh, we know how much we have, uh, how much mix we have, and so we add the flavor at a certain percentage okay. that we've already uh, tested out. So now uh, when we're gonna, before we freeze the mix, we add in the flavors. So uh, we've got some already weighed out here. We'll pour it right in and uh, under agitation so it gets blended properly. Give it some time to mix in well. Richard, this is vanilla, right? No, caramel. Oh, caramel, this is the caramel flavor we put in, yep. So we turn up the speed of the agitator to make sure it blends in completely before we go to freeze. Was there a certain reason you use stainless steel to make it in? The reason why we use the stainless steel is, is mainly around um, hygiene, so cleanliness. Stainless steel, of course, doesn't rust, so we can use water and, and 
liquid products in there and it doesn't deteriorate the stainless steel. And we can use some surface cleaners on the stainless steel and sanitizers that uh, may deteriorate some other types of metals. We've got the flavor. Uh -huh. And about how long will that stay in there until you go to the next step? So um, as, as long as the flavor's been blended properly, we can uh, immediately start to uh, draw it for freezing. All right, so we've added the flavor. We're ready to go? Let's go. All right. Yep, after flavoring the mix, uh, next thing is freezing it. So um, uh, as you see behind us here, um, we'll run it through one of our freezers. What, we, what we're running today is, um, of course, the mix that we saw with some, with some caramel flavor. Uh, we've got a caramel syrup that goes into it, and then some chocolate-covered cone pieces um, added at the fruit feeder. The way it gets from the freezer down to the end here where we fill, a lot of processes go, go on. The first thing we do is, is actually freeze that mix. We want to send it through this freezer where we use ammonia to freeze the barrel. And the, the, there's a long barrel that, uh, that we fill that mix into, and there's some ammonia that's, that's enrobed on that barrel. And as it draws heat from that mix, and it evaporates off, and that's how we uh, drop the temperature. So on the inside, we have what's called a dasher. It's, it's a blade. There could be two or three blades that uh, rotate around the barrel and scrape off all the mix that's been frozen to the side and the little tiny ice crystals. That just keeps going and going and going until we get the um, amount frozen that we need. And you were mentioning a little bit about something about some of the ingredients that are going in here right now. So, Kelsey, you want to hold your hands out right there and we'll take a little look. And what exactly is going into this right now? Yep, so this is uh, what we're going to dispense through our fruit feeder. Um, these are chocolate-covered cone pieces. We want our cones to stay uh, crispy in the ice cream. So we want to cover it in a fat coating um, uh, to provide a water barrier. Uh, so they don't get soggy, so they'll stay a little crispy in, in the ice cream at the end. All right, so we've got everything going on in back of us, freezing, and then as it's coming out, finished product right here. If this were to get uh, produced at a larger scale, say our, our factory here in, in Bakersfield or one of our other facilities across the nation, um, this would be an automated system. So it would look very similar coming out, um, but it would be automated on a table or a belt and, and rotate through. Um, and it would be uh, a lot faster than what we're seeing here. Now, these guys are manually doing this packaging. Are they also going to partake in some of the sampling while it's going on? We want to do one more thing before we actually taste it out of here, is uh, run some samples uh, through our micro lab to make sure that it's, it's, uh, the finished product is safe to eat. It hasn't been contaminated throughout the production process. So we don't, not only do we do that here, but we do that in our production facilities uh, before we ship out any product. All right, well, you know what? I know that we've got these pieces right here, and we can That's right. sample that right now, but what do you say we head over to the lab and sample the whole product? Sounds great. All right, let's head over. Uh, we'll taste some of the product and uh, make sure that it's up to our quality standards. Okay. All right, you know what? Have you ever gone like this? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Mm -hmm. That's what it was like that when we went over to Nestle and uh, checking out all the ice cream and things like that over there. The sweeter side of science, the nicest side of science, yes. I say it is also. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530. Don't forget, if you're a student or an instructor at any school and you have not received your stickers, uh, binder dividers, posters, anything like mm -hmm. that, we do have these available for you. And all you have to do is give us a call. The phone numbers are at the bottom of your screen. Simply let us know where you go to school and that you need some more stickers, binder dividers, posters, or you just haven't received them as of yet. But we know we sent them out to every single school in Kern County because I witnessed the girls pack them <laughs> and send them off. So I know they all were delivered, whether or not they ended up in the right hands or whatever, but we are quite confident that they went out to every single school in Kern County. But if you do need more, simply give us a ring and we'll by all means send those out to you. We're gonna get you back to work in just a couple of minutes. But right now we're gonna go back out to Chevron with Devin. 
Thanks a lot. Back here at Chevron, at uh, Chevron with uh, Quinn Woodard, our uh, business unit electrical engineer here, uh, standing in front of the new number one item on my um, holiday wish list. Uh, this is incredible. Quinn, tell us a little bit about what we're staring at. So right now we're in the uh, demonstration simulation lab that I mentioned earlier. So this is where we validate our engineer solutions prior to uh, installing them at the oil fluid operations. Uh, we got eight screens going here. These six to my right are of some of our facilities out in Midway Sunset, and then we have another one here of our current river facilities. So you're able to see the output and what's going on with a lot of these pumps and sites across uh, California from this very room. Correct. So you'll see similar panels installed at the plant location for operators to sit and monitor and ensure that everything is operating uh, as it is designed. So then over here, we have a different kind of setup. Explain what's going on yeah, here. Yeah, this is a screen. recently uh, piloted project for our Kern River facility. It's called the Kern River Smart Grid. And what you have here is real data coming into a system. And it, it really is a smart system. It has generation control built into it, load shedding capability. Um, and it's, it has also an analytical uh, suite of tools which engineers can access. So there's power coming in, obviously, from your main uh, provider of energy, but it looks like there's also power going back out to it. So That's explain correct. the balance of those two. Yeah, so Chevron, at many of our facilities, we have our own self-generation. Here we have uh, three units operating currently, so we have our Seeker East Ridge uh, units as well, and then we also have uh, tie points with PG&E where we purchase or export power. So we want to make sure that there's a good balance of power coming in versus power going out. Uh, you know, one of the things that you know, you may wonder is if we have all this technology and, and, and all this, you know, computer power and, and, and processing happening, you know, why would we have a dry erase board to work out all the math by hand? And, you know, when coming up with decisions that have to do with figuring out how much is going in and how much is going out, a lot of that gets worked out by hand. And that's correct, right? We mentioned this is immediately after the engineering design phase is complete. You have to test it and ensure that it is working as you originally designed. And if it doesn't, then you literally go to the whiteboard, work with your integrators, your programmers to get the output that you desire. So worst case scenario, some of these go out and you still have to make those decisions. You have to know exactly how the computer processes all that information so that you can do it yourself. And that's exactly correct. There is a period where we have opportunity to optimize, work with the uh, operations personnel to ensure that we give them the product that we promised. So let's take a look at an example of the kind of work we would do on the whiteboard that you know the computer is going to be able to do really quickly. Yeah, sure. So uh, let's, let's take a real business plan example here at Chevron, right? So we're in the business of drilling oil wells. So let's say I am working with my petroleum engineer. He tells me that we're going, he or she tells me we're going to drill 10 wells. And uh, facilities guys and the production engineers, they tell me each well is going to be about 50 horsepower. I have to assess whether I can add that additional load to my electrical system without causing major issues. Now I can go into the computer and model those loads and put it into the smart grid system and see how it reacts, but I also have to validate the numbers that are coming in. So that's the example I want to work out with you today. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at how the computer would process that so that when we see it in the computer, we can check and make sure that it's all right. Because hey, even computers make some mistakes sometimes. Yeah, so uh, the, the first thing we mentioned, we have 10 wells, right? And each one is at 50 horsepower. So the total horsepower for us will be 500 horsepower. Now let's do a, a simple uh, one-line diagram of our electrical system, right? Sure. So typical system, you pointed out that we have self-generation there, so you have your generation loop. Down from there, you have your protective device, typically a circuit breaker or a fuse. And then you have your transformer that steps down the power. And then another protective device, and then you go out to your field loads. And so these loads here are where we have to assess if each one of these devices can handle that added load. So right now we're going to focus on the capacity of the transformer. So the transformer is rated at 500 kVA, and if you remember from the power triangle example we did earlier, kVA is your apparent power. So I'll draw that there just for a quick reference. So here's your apparent power, your reactive power, and then your real power. So 500 would be represented with the hypotenuse, is that, that right? That is correct. Okay. All right, so now we have to get this, because horsepower and KVA are two different units, so now we need to get this into amps, and then we'll eventually transform the KVA into amps as well and compare whether or not we have sufficient capacity to add these new loads. So there's a lot of unit conversion, and, and you know, in school we started talking about unit conversion around fifth and sixth grade. That continues on, it's just that the types of units become a little bit more complex and expand outside of uh, just linear types of measurements. Correct, that, that's exactly right. Um, and we do this often, and oftentimes I have a, a heavy workload, so uh, I, I tend to memorize a lot of the conversion factors just to make it a little bit easier. So uh, we want to change this into real power, right? So 500 horsepower, conversion factor to kilowatts is 0.746. So I'll cross my units there. I'll round that guy up to, to 5, 6, 4, 
and that gives me uh, 375 kilowatts, right? So being right now, we want to be cautious with the rounding, right? Because, you know, a lot of times that, that rounding can be the difference and, and being off by a little bit can have a big impact. So you have to be very precise about when deciding why to round. Exactly. So if I do see numbers that show me close to a limitation or capacity limitation, I can go back within it and tweak and do the actual calculation. So, you know, all these little skills that we're talking about here, just at the very start of this calculation, these are things that kids start doing in the classroom around fifth, sixth grade, this component of rounding, unit conversion, uh, even just the simple multiplication here, multiplying by a factor of 10 for this situation. You know, we start to do that even at the third or fourth grade level. So, you know, what we're seeing here is that these skills that we see in the classroom build on each other at this type of situation in your position. That's correct. It's completely foundational. You have to have the basics down before you can go through the big stuff. And we're going to transition up to some of the equations I learned in my undergrad studies uh, in electrical engineering. So uh, I mentioned we wanted to get similar units. We're still at KVA. We're still at kilowatts. Um, I need to get this in amps so I can compare the capacity of the transformer. So I'm going to use the uh, power equation P. That's my real power units of watts. Uh, square root of three because it's three phase power times volts times current times our power factor. All right, and we're going to solve for I, which is amps. So I have 375 kilowatts, square root of three. Our secondary distributed voltage in the field for Chevron is 480 volts, and that's pretty standard, times I. And we're going to assume that our system uh, has no losses, a power factor of one. Okay. All right, so now we solve for I. So I is equal to uh, square root of, or let's take 375, divided by square root of 3 times 480 times 1. Now again, I work with these factors all the time, so square root of 3, 1.732, times 480 is 832. And remember, this is kilowatts, so we have the prefix there, kilo, so you multiply times 1,000, so 375,000, divided by 831, and that typically is around 450, 451 amps. So that's our load in amps from 500 horsepower. Now, a lot of these seem like they, they took a lot to kind of plug in and calculate in, but these are pretty standard uh, that you have knowledge of when it comes to the experience with these types of terms. So these numbers didn't come from thin air. There was a reason for all of these based on the type of work that you've done over the course of years and just your knowledge of this type of setup. Yeah, typically, yeah, when dealing with any project, you have a, a system of constraints, right? So there was a decision made uh, for our secondary distributed voltage, which is usually comes from the utility or the service provider, for it to be 480. Uh, the square root of three are standard equations that we utilize within power analysis, and those are the outputs. So you've got your situation, you've got your problem, and then you've got some givens and you've got some constraints. Mm -hmm. You know, what this is right off the bat is, is your standard problem solving model. And if you watch this, Quinn did this, one of the things that you noticed is that it wasn't necessarily easy work, it was familiar, and it was deliberate. He had a plan for how he did it, and he kept working through to make sure that he got to that point that he was confident in because of the patterns that we had seen. So, you know, this process of problem solving, it's not going to take place right away. You're not going to be able to get something like this in 20 seconds or so. But by continuing to work through this, it becomes more natural. That's exactly right. Day-to-day um, -day operations, we get, we get queries from our operations folk. Can you tell us the loading of this transformer? Tell us the loading on this motor control center, this substation. Uh, we have several capacity strengths that we have to focus on with any business um, operation. So uh, we have our output of amps. We're not done yet, so we still need to confirm, can we add this here because we're in different units? And that's a really interesting point is that a lot of times it's just finding one piece of information that you could use later on because problem solving doesn't just necessarily end with the solution. That's correct. We're going to come back here with Quinn a little bit later on to talk a little bit about how to get into a situation like this through school and the types of opportunities that Chevron provides as well. So back to the studio. All right. Sounds great. Looking forward to that. Hey, do remember we have phone tutors available until 530. We've got Thomas in studio with us right now. We're going to play a little game. On the board, we have a couple of numbers. We go from 12 all the way down to negative five. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll two dice. And when I roll the dice, you'll be playing against Chuck, and you'll each take a turn. When I roll the dice, here's an example, okay? You can either add them or subtract them. And let me just make this so that we have two different numbers there. So you can add them so you could mark nine. You could subtract them where you could go six minus three is three, 
or you could go 3 minus 6 to get negative 3. Because on the board we see we have negative numbers up there as well. All right. The goal is to get 3 in a row. All right. If you roll the dice and something comes up and there's no way for you to put a marker on the board, do you just lose your turn? Got it? Got it. All right, head on over to the board. All right, so I'll roll the dice. Okay, you be red, I'll be black. All right, so Thomas will let you go first. I'll roll these dice. Oh, look at that. We've got a three and a three. So what are the options that you have, first of all, that you could mark with a three and a three? I could add them. I can subtract them. So if you added them, what would you get? I would get six. And if you subtracted them, what would you get? I would get zero. Any other options you have? I can do no. Yeah, that's it, right? Yeah. It's kind of tricky. And we know no use one of those, on right? One. We have to choose. You have to use one of those. So one. you have to either mark six or zero. Which one would you like? Six. All right, Wait, so why don't you go ahead and put an X over that six? There you go. Let's see if I can move this back. Okay. So All right, sure here we go. Chuck, you're up, and okay. you've got a six and a three. Six and a three. So I could do. Six plus three, I could get nine, or I could get a three, or a negative three. So let's see, I'll take, I'll take the three, and I'll put um, X there. All right, Thomas, you're up. Here we go, we'll roll the dice. And we've got a two and a four. I would like to subtract them. Right, because if you add them, what would you get? I would get um, six. And, and you I already marked that, so. Yeah. So you can either go two or negative two, and he's going with a two. All right. Two and a two. That's for you. Two and a two. So I can either go four or zero. Hmm, I don't like either one of those, but. You have to take one. I have to take one of them. Hmm? So I'll take four or zero. It looks like a toss up. I'll take the zero. All right, Thomas, taking a look at the board, what would you like the outcome to be? I would think maybe a 10 or a 2. Negative 2, right? Yeah, negative right. 2. So negative. let's see if we can roll a 10 or a negative 2. All right, we've got a 3 and a 4. I would like to actually subtract those. Four okay. subtract 3 equals 1, so I would like to subtract. All right, you've got yourself set up nicely diagonally there as well. All right, next up, a one and a five. One and a five, so I can get a six or a four or a negative four. A six, can't use a six, a four or a negative four. So I guess I'll take the negative four and actually oh, try to block. Look at okay. that. He's going to block you, Thomas, that negative four. I was looking at way. you. You're going to be sweet set up a couple of different ways. All right. Here we go. Thomas is up again. We've got a five and a six. I would like I got five and six. So I could do six. I would like to do six, five, take away. Wait, no, six, take away five. If you go six, take away five, you're going to get one, but you've already got one crossed off. Oh, then I'll do five, or six take away. No, wait, five take away six. Then you would have negative one. Let me ask you to do one thing first. Consider <laughs> the other option. What? what Instead else could of you subtracting, do what else could you do? I could add. And what would you get? Eleven. Would, now, before you do that, would you still like to take the eleven or the negative one? Eleven. Why? Because I would win. There you go. You've already got the three in a row. Nicely done right there. Round of applause for our Very man. Good. Thomas right there. So that way, see, because sometimes kids play and they're like, well, I want to go with the negative one, but take a look at all your options, right? And then that way you see you can win a little quicker. Yeah. Because right. a, a lot of times people take the first thing they think of and they see that first one and they, yeah. And the reason I wanted you to play this game is to get familiar with negative numbers. Because in fourth grade, a lot of students, you kind of start doing that a little bit, but as you get into fifth and sixth grade, you do it a little bit more. All right, erase the board, boys, because you've got a couple of minutes and I've got some problems I need you to work on. Okay. All right. Thomas, I'm going to have you, because you said you started working with fractions recently, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have you, why don't you write down one fraction, any number over another number you would like, and I'll come up with the other one. So one half. All right. To that, you're going to add. So put an addition symbol in there. And let's add three over four. 
Now, you have unlike denominators. Do you know what you would do there, or do you need a little bit of assistance? I think I would, I think I would add both of them, like, or I think I would multiply the top, the bottom, and the top, or do I, I think I cross to You're multiply. You're on the right track, so Chuck's right, right track. there to help you out with this okay. one. So when we're working with fractions, because these are different kinds of fractions, right? Th this is one half, but this is three fourths. They're different fractions because the denominators, the bottom numbers are different. So what we have to do is we have to get these two fractions to have the same denominator. So this is three fourths. Can we write a fraction that's the same as one half that has a four on the bottom? So we come yes. over here and we think, what does one half equal besides one half? Uh, it equals. Here's one half, isn't it? So there's one half, isn't it? Yeah. But isn't one half the same as? Two fourths. Two fourths, right? Yeah. So isn't one half equal to two fourths? And we can see that from the picture, right? Yeah. If I take that same one half and cut it in four pieces, I've got two fourths. So we're going to rewrite this problem right below each one of those, right? Three, two fourths, right? So let's let's rewrite that as. Oh, two fourths. Two fourths. Plus, now you notice this is already four. So right, let's write that as three fourths. So if you have two fourths and you're going to add, let's look at this, you're going to add one, two, three fourths, what's your answer going to be? My answer is going to be five fourths. Five fourths. Notice you added the top, right? right? But what were you counting? You were counting how many fourths you have. So it's one, two, three, four, five. But the size of those pieces didn't change, did they? No. So we didn't add the bottoms, we just carried that across because that's how many fourths that we had in that problem. Because if you have the same denominator mm -hmm. as four, two of them are four, but if, if the top's not the same, then it will equal a different number than the denominator. Right, some students want to add those and get five-eighths for the answer, and we can't do that. Right. Okay. So quickly, since that's improper, why don't we go ahead and simplify that five-fourths into a mixed number? And how many fourths does it take to make one whole? It would equal th four one, fourths. One, two, three, four fourths is right there. Plus, what do we have here? We have one more. So here's five fourths, right? But right. if we just rearrange them, here's one, two, three, four, five fourths also. Yeah. But you said four fourths is? Four fourths. And what does that equal as a whole number? Isn't that one whole? Yeah. So let's write that as one whole, one. Yeah, make it nice and big as a whole number. And we have one fourth left over, so the answer is one and, write your answer is do one I, and one fourth. Do write I write four. and? No, no, just write the one fourth right next to it. One fourth. But it's one fourth like this. Oh, so yeah. your answer is the whole number one and one fourth. Then there's your answer. There you go. So something a little new for you right there, Thomas, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you got an idea on adding fractions, but now we did them with unlocked denominators got an improper fraction, turned it into a mixed number, whole lot of things we can do from there. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30, but one last time, we'll head on out to Chevron and Devin. Thanks a lot, Mike. Back here with Quinn Woodard here at uh, Chevron, and uh, we are kind of at the, the brain center here. <laughs> um, Quinn, tell us a little bit about the workspace we got here. Yeah, this is my day-to-day -day work uh, space. I typically start here in the morning, uh, check a few emails, and it's usually a little messy, scattered with drawings and reference materials so I can uh, solve problems related to electrical engineering. Nobody ever said that math and science had to be neat. Don't worry about that, folks. Uh, Quinn, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into this situation, wh what your start was, and, and kind of your, your academic uh, pathway. All right, sure. Uh, originally from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, my, my, my dad's a restaurateur. My mom's a nurse, so no real uh, pathway into engineering. I had the opportunity to uh, participate in the Project Lead the Way program, right? So pre-engineering in high school, hands-on, project-based learning. And that really sparked my interest. From there, I decided I wanted to pursue this in college. and. And there I went, and the rest was history. You know, Project Lead the Way has a pretty significant footprint here in the schools in Bakersfield as an entry point into the, the fields of engineering, not just, you know, and not just for boys, too, but for girls uh, and, and anybody of any background. And, you know, that was a, a really, from what we understand, a really important role that uh, 
that, that got you into the field, especially with Chevron and the connection. Can you talk a little bit about Chevron's role with Project Lead the Way? Definitely. So Chevron is a huge uh, sponsor of um, Project Lead the Way, one of the national sponsors. Of, we've donated several millions of dollars to the program. And what it did for me is it, it essentially connected the dots between uh, the, real cl the classroom and the real world, right? Project-based learning, I spoke to that, working in groups. Um, from there, I was able to get uh, research internships. And then eventually, because of my past curriculum, it led to a Chevron internship, and that, that ultimately turned into a full-time position. So you mentioned internships and involvement with the company at a, at a real early age. Uh, when did you? What, at what age did you start working with Chevron to start to get a feel for the the structure of the organization? Um, so it was, it was after my freshman year. I was about 20 years old. I had my first internship with Chevron, um, doing real project work with electrical engineers, spending real dollars. Uh, I had a lot of responsibility, and the company counted on me to to reach my goal and deliverables. So real early on, before you even had, you know, before graduation, you were able to, to, to find that connection within the company and to prove before you graduated that, that you had the ability to, to create something and, and to provide uh, a benefit to, to, the, to, to Chevron. That's correct. That was the opportunity I had to apply the theoretical that I learned in my undergrad studies, and it became practical, working in the oil field operations, uh, designing electrical power systems, and working with a great team. So if somebody wants to get involved with the intern program here at Chevron, what, what would you recommend? Uh, the first step is to talk to your, your guidance counselors, right? Typically, we don't have opportunities for our high school students, but once you have your first semester in college under your belt, there are many opportunities out there. Get involved with research. Get involved with different organizations. Take on leadership uh, responsibility because those are some of the items that Chevron looks at. It's not just about uh, having the grade. You have to be a well-rounded individual. So as far as what kids can do in high school, are there any course recommendations or uh, fields that you'd recommend that students get into in their coursework? Definitely. So if you hope to pursue anything in STEM, especially engineering, you have to have a strong math background. Now, it doesn't have to be the best math background, but you have to start somewhere. So typically in high school, you want to be taking Algebra 1, Algebra 2, uh, pre-calculus, calculus if your school offers it, offers it, and then statistics, of course. And of course, some of the schools here in Bakersfield offer that Algebra 1 even as early as 8th grade, so that's going awesome. to get in pretty soon. Well, Quinn, again, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank and you. on behalf of Do the Math, we wanted to offer you the courtesy and honorary tile. Very, very rare here in our community, but <laughs> emblematic of the work that you do. Quinn, again, thank you very much thank for you. joining us this it. afternoon. Mike, back to you. All right, nicely done out there, Devin, and thank you also to Quinn. I know that uh, I've had an opportunity to work with Quinn in the past. Excellent guy, and uh, once again, a big thanks to Adam Alvidrez and everybody else over at Chevron for getting that set up. A lot of great things, a lot of great opportunities for students to uh, get into engineering, math, and yep. Chevron is a big supporter of Do The Math, so we do appreciate those guys for helping us out for the past 16 years that we've been doing yes. this, so thank you for that. Also, uh, Fuel Your School, and a, uh, they're big, big into donating to classrooms throughout Kern County and other counties as well, but I know that uh, the Chevron here in Bakersfield, big into donating and making sure that uh, classrooms have exactly what they need to help kids work on a lot of different projects that they're doing. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 in the afternoon, and Thomas, we'd like to thank you for coming in this afternoon. Did you have a good time? Yes, I did. All right, you know what? We usually give you a uniform, but you're already wearing yours, so we're gonna have you turn this way right now for camera three so everybody can see your do the math shirt. So the deal is, now we tell this to all of the students and some of the students do this, but you need to wear the shirt every day. Okay. Okay, so your mom's over there kind of like, yeah, okay, that's nice every day. Every couple of days, how about that? Yeah. All right, yeah. so we'll go ahead and do that. And I gave you some cards so you can let your friends know all about do the math. You're gonna do that? Yeah. And you wanna come back again, don't you? Yes. Well, the next time you do that, we're gonna have a more difficult game and we're gonna make you do some more difficult math. Is that all right? Yeah, I'll probably be smarter that time. You will be. Shake on know. it? Yeah. All Shake. right, nicely done. And congratulations to Colby today. A student from a call have called in earlier, gonna go see the Condors. Congratulations on that. Hey, until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, California Resources Corporation, 
Southern California Edison, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.